RNA secondary structure, dynamic programming over intervals. In the knapsack problems, we were able to formulate a dynamic programming algorithm by adding a new variable. A different but a very common way by which one ends up adding a variable to a dynamic program is through the following scenario. We start by thinking about the set of subproblems on the set 1 to 3 until j for all choices of j and uh, find ourselves unable to come up with a natural recurrence. We then look at the larger set of uh, subproblems on i, i plus 1, i plus 2, and so on until j, such a set for all choices of i and j, where i is less than or equal to j, and find a natural recurrence relation on these subproblems. In this way, we have added the second variable i. The effect is to consider a subproblem for every contiguous interval in the set between 1 to 3 until n. There are a few canonical problems that fit this profile. Those of you who have studied the parsing algorithms for context free grammars have probably seen at least one dynamic programming algorithm in this style. Here we focus on the problem of RNA secondary structure prediction, a fundamental issue in computational biology. The problem, as one learns in an introductory biology classes, Watson and Crick posited that double-stranded DNA is zipped together by complementary base pairing. Each strain of uh, DNA can be viewed as a stream of bases, where each base is drawn from the set A, C, G, and T. The bases A and uh, T pair with each other, and uh, the bases C and G pair with each other. It is uh, these A, T, and C, G pairings that hold the two strains together. Now, single-stranded RNA Molecules are key components in many of the processes that go on inside a cell, and they follow more or less the same structural principles. However, unlike double-stranded DNA, there is no second strand for the RNA to stick to, so it tends to loop back and form base pairs within itself, resulting, resulting in interesting, in interesting shapes, shapes like the, like the one, one depicted in figure, figure 6.16.13. The set of pairs and the resulting shape formed by the RNA molecule through this process is called uh, the secondary structure. And uh, understanding the secondary structure is essential for understanding the behavior of the molecule. For our purposes, a single-stranded RNA molecule can be viewed as a sequence of N symbol spaces drawn from the alphabet, the set A, C, G, T. Let B equals to B1, B2, B3 until Bn be a single-stranded RNA molecule where each Bi is taken from the set ACGU. To a first approximation, one can model its secondary structure as follows. As usual, we require that A pairs with U and C pairs with G. We also require that each base can pair with at most one other base. In other words, the set of base pairs forms a matching. It also turns out that secondary structures are again to a first approximation not free, which we will formalize as a kind of a non-crossing condition below. Thus, concretely, we say that a secondary structure on B is a set of pairs S equals to the set of IJ pair, where I and J is chosen among the set 1 to 3 until n that satisfies the following conditions. 1. No sharp turns. The ends of each pair in S are separated by at least four intervening bases. That is, uh, if uh, ij pair is in S, then i is less than j minus 4. 2. The elements of any pair in S consist of either the set au or the set cg in either order. 3. S is a matching. No base appears in more than one pair. 4. 
the non-crossing condition if uh, the pair ij and the, the pair kl are two pairs in s then we cannot have i less than k less than j less than l see figure 6.14 for an illustration Note that uh, the RNA secondary structure in figure 6.13 satisfies properties 1 through 4. From a structural point of view, condition 1 arises simply because uh, the RNA molecule cannot bend too sharply. And condition 2 and 3 are the fundamental Watson-Crick rules of base pairing. Condition 4 is a striking one. Since uh, it's not obvious why it should hold in nature. But while there are sporadic exceptions to it in real molecules via so called pseudo nothing, it does turn out to be a good approximation to the spatial constraints on real RNA secondary structures. Now, out of all the secondary structures that are possible for a single RNA molecule, which are the ones that are likely to arise under physiological conditions? The usual hypothesis is that a single stranded RNA molecule will form the secondary structure with uh, the optimal total free energy. The correct model for the free energy of a secondary structure is a subset of much debate. But a first approximation here is to assume that the free energy of a secondary structure is proportional simply to the number of base pairs that it contains. Thus, having said all this, we can state that the basic RNA secondary structure prediction problem very simply. We want an efficient algorithm that takes a single stranded RNA molecule B equals to B1, B2, B3 until Bn and determines a secondary structure S with uh, the maximum possible number of base pairs. Designing and analyzing the algorithm. A first attempt at dynamic programming. The natural first attempt to apply dynamic programming would presumably be based on the following subproblems. We say that OPD of J is the maximum number of base pairs in a secondary structure on B1, B2, B3 until Bj. By the no sharp turns condition above, we know that OPT of J is equal to 0 for J which is less than equal to 5. And we know that OPT of N is the solution we are looking for. The trouble comes when we try writing down a recurrence that expresses OPT of J in terms of uh, the solutions to smaller subproblems. We can get part way there in the optimal secondary structure on B1, B2, B3, and Bj is the case that either J is not involved in a pair or J pairs with T for some T which is less than J minus 4. In the first case, we just need to consult our solution for OPT of j minus 1. The second case is depicted in uh, figure 6.15a. Because uh, of the non-crossing condition, we now know that no pair can have one end between 1 and t minus 1, and uh, the other end between t plus 1 and j minus 1. We've uh, therefore effectively isolated two new subproblems, one on the basis B1, B2, B3 under Bt minus 1, and the other on the basis Bt plus 1, Bt plus 2, and so on until Bj minus 1. The first is solved by OBT of T minus 1, but the second is not on our list of subproblems because it does not begin with B1. This is uh, the insight. That makes us realize we need to add a variable. We need to be able to work with subproblems that do not begin with B1. In other words, we need to consider subproblems on Bi, Bi plus 1, Bi plus 2, and so on until Bj for all choices of i which is less than or equal to j. Dynamic programming over intervals. Once we make this decision, our previous reasoning leads straight to a successful recurrence. Let OPT of ij denote the maximum number of base pairs in a secondary structure on bi, bi plus 1, and so on until bj. The no sharp turns condition lets us initialize OPT of ij equals to 0, 
whenever i is greater than or equals to j minus 4. For notational convenience, we will also allow ourselves to refer to OPT of i, j, even when i is greater than j. In this case, its value is 0. Now, in the optimal secondary structure, um, bi, bi plus 1, bi plus 2, and so on until bj, we have the same alternatives as before. j is not involved in a pair, or j pairs with t for some t which is less than j minus 4. In the first case, we have opt of ij is equal to opt of ij minus 1. In the second case, depicted in a figure 6.15b, we recur on the two subproblems opt of i t minus 1 and opt of t plus 1 j minus 1. As argued above, the non crossing condition has isolated these two subproblems from each other. We have therefore justified the following recurrence 6.13. OPT of ij is equal to the maxima chosen among the OPT of ij minus 1 and the maxima of. 1 plus OPT of i t minus 1 plus OPT of t plus 1 j minus 1, where the max is taken over t such that bt and bj are an allowable base pair under conditions 1 and 2 from the definition of a secondary structure. Now we just now have to make we sure we understand have to the proper make sure order in which to build up we the understand solutions the proper to, order in the which to build up the solutions to the subproblems. The form of 6.13 reveals that we are always invoking the solution to subproblems on shorter intervals, for which k is equals to j minus 1 is smaller. Thus, things will work without any trouble if we build up the solutions in order of increasing interval length. Okay, so here's the algorithm. Initialize OBT of ij equals to 0 whenever i is greater than or equals to j minus 4. For k equals to 5, 6, and so on until m minus 1. Such a loop of index with an inner loop for i starting from 1 to 3 until m minus k. We set j equals to i plus k. And uh, we compute the OBT of ij using the recurrence in 6.13. As an example of this algorithm executing, we consider the input ACCGGUAGU a subsequence of the figure of the sequence in figure 6.14. As with the NEPSAT problem, we need two dimensions to depict the, the array M one for the left end point of the interval being considered, and one for the right end point. In the figure, we only show entries corresponding to ij pairs with the i which is less than j minus 4, since that these are the only ones that can possibly be non-zero. It is easy to bound the running time. There are big O of n square subproblems to solve, and evaluating the recurrence in 6.13 takes time big O of n for each. Thus, uh, the running time is a uh, big O of n cube. As always, uh, we can recover the secondary structure itself, not just uh, its value, by recording how the minima in 6.13 are achieved and tracing back through the computation.